So hello everyone and welcome to uh, Elvis's uh, webinar. My name is Marin Dayef. I'm a research engineer in microfluidics at Elvesis, and today I'm going to talk about confined particles in microfluidic devices and more especially uh, the advantage of confinement properties to better control the dimensions and trajectories of particles. So to start with, let's define confinement. Confinement uh, occurs when the size of people or particles is similar to the size of the environment. It uh, involves that their motion is constrained in a certain environment. You can have confinement situations at macro scales, for example, in a spaceship, on a sailboat, in a valley, or our own confinement at home at this moment. And also at micro scale for uh, particles in microfluidic devices, for cells, or for microorganisms swimming in a constrained environment. In all these situations, the particle, the people, will develop some new properties induced by the confinement. In this webinar, we're going to talk specifically on the microscale and on the trajectories of microscale in confined geometries. So most of you, I think, can uh, give me some examples, some situations of confinement at micro scale. For example, you can find confined situations in industrial applications, for example, the paper industry, because actually paper is uh, made of fibers close to each other and they are confined in a sheet of paper. In the oil industry, you have fibers uh, to cure the lost circulations. In pharmaceutic, you need to avoid any confined particles in your systems. That means, for example, to get rid of antibody aggregates in constrictions. In biology, it could be really interesting and powerful to confine cells in droplets with the encapsulations in order to study them. And in medical applications, it's interesting to use a confinement flow to um, improve the efficiency of detection on a biosensor, for example. So in all these examples, you have different structures. For example, non-spherical shapes, flexibility, symmetries. You also have different fluids with different flow geometries, various fluid properties, such as Newtonian or non-Newtonian. There are then a large complexity of interactions due to the numerous degrees of freedom. In this webinar, we're going to talk about one specific application, the sorting of particles. So to make a brief overview of different techniques used to select particles in microfluidic devices, we can have, for example, a specific geometry in the design of the, ge um, of the microfluidic device, for example, with pillar type, we can then sort particles uh, depending on their shape. We can also use external fields such as acoustic radiation force. This force induces a shift of the particles in the microfluidic uh, channel, and we can then collect the particles sorted by size at the end of multiple outlets. It's also possible to use gravity forces that induces sedimentation of the particles, and the bigger the particle, the faster the sedimentation occurs. So in all these examples, you can see that the particles have similar shapes and different sizes. We will see in this webinar how it is possible to sort particles depending on their shapes using their confinement. So to start with, before studying these particles in microfluidic devices, we need to control their formation, control their shape, their size, etc. And we will see that the confinement itself can help control the fabrication of the particles. So we're going to see the fibers, the, the case of the fibers and photolithography, and the case of droplets and bubbles. In the second part, we're going to see how it is interesting to use confinement to differentiate transport trajectories to see the influence of the symmetry of the particles and also the influence of channel geometry and to finish we are just going to look over some applications other applications involving droplets and bubbles in confined geometries 
So to start with, we're going to talk about fabrication. One uh, technique really interesting to form solid particles directly in microfluidic channels is the photolithography method. You have a solution of a photosensitive solution of polymer and photoinitiator in a microfluidic channel. You uh, project a UV light through a mask under a microscope in the microfluidic channel. The solution will polymerize within hundreds of milliseconds and so the targeted region will become rigid. The light will go through all the microfluidic channel, but there will be some part where the polymerization doesn't occur. In fact, due to the presence of dissolved oxygen along the top and bottom walls of the channel, there will be no polymerization here. And then the rigid particle is created in the middle of the channel and can freely move. It's really interesting because this method of fabrication also defines the confinement of the particle, that we define the transversal confinement, that we define uh, the ratio over the height of the fiber and the height of the microfluidic channel. This inhibition layer remains the same even if you change the geometry of the microfluidic channel. As a result, you can control the confinement of the fiber by just changing the height of the microfluidic channel. The photolithography then good fabrication method to control the size and the orientation of the fibers and also control the fiber confinements by the size of the channel. Now for droplets and bubbles fabrication. It depends mostly on the geometry of the microfluidic device. For example, you can have a co-flow geometry, a cross-flow geometry, and a flow focusing geometry. In all these geometries, because of the confined geometry, you have capillary instabilities inhibited. And as a result, you have an amazing control over the size, the shape, the uniformity, and the rate of formation. So now let's talk about the transport trajectories. First, we're going to look at a really simple case. That is to say, a rigid particle with two axes of symmetry. For example, an elongated fiber. So you have one axis of symmetry here and another one here. So in this, um, in this kind of experiment, you have the fiber here in the middle of the channel. You don't take into account the lateral rules. You just look at the confinement on the transversal orientation. That is to say the ratio H over H capital. As I just said, if you increase the height of the channel, you increase the confinement. It has been demonstrated that because of the viscous forces induced by the top and bottom walls of uh, the microfluidic channels, this velocity of the perpendicular fiber is faster than the one of parallel fiber. And this phenomenon increases if you increase the confinement. So as a result, if you have a fiber with a different orientation from parallel or perpendicular, you will have a drift when the fiber will flow in the microfluidic channel. So the velocity of a transported elongated fiber in a confined geometry depends on its orientation. Now, if we complexify the problem, and if we look at rigid particles with only one axis of symmetry, for example, asymmetric dermal particles with the axis of symmetry here. If we look at Mickey Mouse uh, shape, if we look at pair, a pair of droplets or a T-shaped fiber, you can see that in all these examples, we have the same behavior. First, we have a reorientation process until an equilibrium orientation. And this equilibrium orientation is achieved when the mirror axis is aligned with the flow direction and the upper part is upstream. So the only difference in all these experiments where we have the same behavior is only on the time scales. The time scales of the reorientation will depend on the particle shape. So for a one axis of symmetry particle, you have a reorientation process toward an equilibrium orientation, and the so time scales depend on the particle shape. 
If we complexify even more the problem and now look at rigid particles with no axis of symmetry, for example, L-shaped fiber, we have first a reorientation process, so rotation of the particle. And after that, when the particle achieved an equilibrium orientation, you have a drift on the side wall of the channel. So in this case, for no axis of symmetry, the particle will rotate towards an equilibrium orientation and it's followed by the drift motion. Now, if we look at another type of confinement, the lateral confinement, that is to say, the impact of the lateral walls in the channel. So for example, now the ratio uh, involved will be the, the length of the fiber over the width of the channel. So if we look at elongated fibers with two axes of symmetry, you can see that if the, the initial orientation of the fiber is tilted, you will have oscillations between the lateral walls, same here. Now, if we look at a particle with no axis of symmetry, we will have a reorientation process, and after a while, the particle will be stuck, stuck sorry, along one wall. So in this case, with the, the impact of the lateral walls, we have two different behavior. Either the particle with two axes of symmetry oscillates between the walls, either the particle with no axis of symmetry is trapped along one wall. So with all this example, we have seen that the trajectories of the different particle uh, shapes are really different if we consider the, the, the axis of symmetries. So now if we increase a little bit more the difficulty and the complexity of the problem, we can add deformability to the particle. And now we have then a coupling between the transport and the deformation of the particle. So at first, we have a deformation, a reorientation process until the fiber is aligned with the flow direction. It has been demonstrated that the more confined the fiber, the greater the deformation. A lot of work still needs to be done on this area to understand the coupling between the deformation and the, flexi the flexibility so of the fiber and the transport. So now to uh, show you some other applications involving bubbles and droplets in confined geometries. We can look at the physics of droplets, for example, by studying the coalescence and non-coalescence behavior of confined droplets with splitting or uh, coalescence behaviors. Another possibility is to generate actually on self-propel droplets using gradient of confinement. It's also possible using just a confined bubble to sort particles because the smallest particles will go after the confined bubble while the biggest particles will be trapped along the bubble. And it's also possible to look at the transport of a pair of droplets, the rebound, the pair exchanges, and the reorientation processes that are really similar to the kind of uh, reorientation process I showed you before. So to conclude, I hope that uh, you understood today how confinement can help for the accuracy and flexibility of fabrication of particles. I hope also that you get how it's important to understand the complex trajectories of the particles depending on their asymmetries because it's then able to it's then possible to sort particles. Here are all the um, publications I used for this webinar, so you can have a look if you want any more details. And to finish, uh, I wish you a very nice day. I hope you enjoyed attending this webinar today. And uh, if you have any questions, please comment the video. Uh, we'll be happy to answer uh, the questions for you.